Now, we're out with the Cold Steel Magnum Kokori Machete and the Japanese Garden Machete. Extremely different blades. The Japanese Garden Machete is much thicker, dramatically. Flat on the back completely. Has a flat, then convex bevel on the front. So it's chisel ground out of much thicker stock. The cold steel magnum kukuri machete is much thinner, so look directly, but it's also much longer. So the overall weights and general hefts are about the same, dramatically different in profile. This again is just a customization. I thinned out the blade dramatically in this area. Still working on the primary hump up around here where the sticker is. I'll thin that out later on. Okay. Get in there. Now, there's a fairly freshly windblown three right there. Way, way back there. There's one that went down quite some time ago. It's kind of a bit blasty. In there, way in there behind the clutch of trees. Move a bit clearly. You can see some really bad blasty boughs right there on that tree. They're going to be very difficult to cut. So that's going to be useful to have a look at. And of course, on the floor itself, we're littered with all these young sticks that have felled over, wind blown over. So we got quite a nice range of vegetation to cut here. And look at the two blades and have some thoughts and some comments about the type of performance we can get. Now we've taken down the fairly fresh tree that was blown over. A couple of little sticks that were in the way. A couple of immediate observations. The Japanese garden machete, because the edge angle is more acute, goes into the wood much easier with lighter force. So when you're using it, you can take the limbs off these with very light wrist pops. With the Magnum Kukuri machete, it's a larger swing, and you can feel more impact back towards you. That's nothing that needs to be measured or counted. The difference is very dramatic. Even just clearing out this tree, it was immediately obvious to me that it would take much more work to do it with the Magnum Kukuri machete, because I was having to put more effort into it. Whereas the Japanese guard machete was almost cutting through the wood rather than actually chopping. Now, of course, a big advantage of the Magnum Kukuri machete is simply the raw length of it. So I could take a tree by one end, and with the Magnum machete and my arm, I'm cutting out five to six feet in front of me. So I only need to essentially make a couple of passes or move the wood a couple of times and I got it limbed out. So there's a bit of an advantage there. But the most significant factor is this. The Japanese garden machete is chisel ground. And you can see after even this light work, there's a spot right there on the edge and I'll slowly turn it. And you can see where it's dented and turned over to the side. Turn it back slowly. And this is fairly light work. You can see it relatively really obvious right there in the middle. Now, the reason why the edge will turn relatively easy, and notice it always turns from the ground side toward the chisel side. The reason it does that is that when you're limbing out a tree, you can't always do it the proper way with a chisel ground blade, which is the cut like this, with the chisel side facing in. If you do it like that, you won't have a problem. But when you get to limbs like this, are you really going to walk all the way around the tree, or are you just going to pop them off like that? You're obviously going to do that. But then you're cutting with the chisel side out. That's very difficult on the blade. So here's a nice heavy limb. Now, when I cut into that limb, like that, the wood exerts a force on the blade, straight into the edge of the blade. If I can position this here like that. Perfect. Now, because this side is ground, that means a proportion of the force goes that way across the blade. So it tends to push the blade that way. This side is perfectly flat. There's no counterbalancing force. So that means when you're chopping like this, that force that goes this way 
due to this angle, there's no counterbalancing force here because this side is perfectly flat. That means it's very easy for the edge to turn and roll that way on chisel ground blades. So to maximize the durability, you should always cut with them chisel side in. And when you cut with them chisel side in, the durability is extremely high. The problem is, you get to a tree like this, how do you cut this limb? You've got to slowly work around all this side and keep the chisel ground side in. So you can do that and you won't have nearly the amount of problems. And you can see there the sort of ripple that came when I turned it from the other side. So I had this really nice blasty tree. You better shot at it. And my intention was to clean half of it out with the Japanese guard machete, half of it out with the Magnum Curry machete, talk a bit about feel. Not everything goes away according to plan. When I started working with the Japanese guard machete, I thought it'd be a better idea to see, could I clean this entire tree out by using it properly, chisel side in and avoid any edge damage? Because this is really about the hardest work that you're ever gonna have to do with a knife outside. These limbs are extremely, what they call blasty around here, which means they're extremely hard. And they're kind of nasty when you're walking around because they form very, very sharp edges. You don't want to run into them. They're also very difficult to cut because they're extremely hard and they tend to crack. And because they're so hard, they transmit huge amounts of shock when you're chopping with them, simply because you get almost no penetration in them. They're just exceptionally hard. So I figured, let me have a look at this with proper technique, chisel side in and start cutting. So I cleared off all the front to about five feet high. Went around the side, cleared around all of that around five feet high. Moved around to the back. So I only had about 25% of the tree left. So I was feeling fairly positive about the Japanese guard machete until this happened. Ka-chunker. The handle went. Now, if you look at it, you can see it just broke right around where the pins are and the major crack happened as the pin sort of busted through the wood. And it's a very, very thin pin. And this is a relatively hard, obviously, splintery type wood. So it cracked. Now I've done a fair amount of chopping with this on relatively soft, large diameter woods and construction lumbers, no problem. But they don't transmit near the amount of force back to the blade as this kind of wood does. Because again, it's such a small diameter and it's so hard, you get very little penetration into it. So all the full energy of that swing gets transmitted back to the blade in a very short period of time when it comes to a very abrupt halt. And I was chopping fairly heavily on this. Just to, well, I can't really swing it now. But, positive thing is, if you look at the forward section of the blade, the little tiny dent there is at the very, very bottom. That's when I was using it the wrong way. I was cutting uh, chisel side out, which you shouldn't do with chisel ground blade. So chisel side in, I was able to cut all of this very hard wood with the original profile. So the original profile is very balanced. It's strong enough with proper technique to cut even this type of wood. And again, cuts and slices are very fine. But the handle that it comes with, now there always could be faults in woods, who knows what happens, that kind of stuff. But this particular handle wasn't up to the strain of cutting this type of wood. Because again, the shock that it happens, that it sends back to the handle, is dramatic because you get very little penetration. Now I'll just do a small snap chop. There's the actual cut right there where it broke on. And you can see how shallow a cut that is. And that's a full force chop. Barely went into the wood at all. Because again, this wood is rock hard. But if you look at the cuts, you can see how smooth the blade is actually cutting. And again, underneath it, it tends to crack. That's again because it's a little bit cold out. But this wood is just exceptionally hard. So it tends to crack an awful lot. So you can see there. But when it's cutting, it cuts very smooth, very fine. So, I didn't get the exact performance comparison that I wanted. But I did get some useful information. I found out that if I chopped carefully, I could even use very heavy force with proper technique, working chisel side into the cut, and I could easily clear very hard wood without damage to the blade. I also found that if I worked it the other way, chisel side out, the edge would turn relatively easily. I needed a very smooth, very clean cut to keep the blade edge stable. So I was interested in those two things. I was interested in the handle door building, and later on, one of the things I planned to look at was could this blade be used as a fro? Could you pound it through wood by pounding on the back of it? Because I was curious whether or not the handle was durable enough. Well, as it turns out, it's not durable enough even for very heavy chopping. And one of the kind of curious things is 
if you look inside you can see the cutouts for the pins go almost all the way to the top of the wood so there's very little full wood and you can see that's where the crack started right at the top of the pin so as I was chopping with the blade there's a counter rotation right here on the tang which pressed out and it only had to crack this little thin piece of wood on top to cause the handle to split completely basically down its entire length now it's also arguable whether or not this blade is actually meant for that type of work it's advertised as a garden machete it's not like I was using it as a garden machete I was out limbing some dead wood off a very old tree that was very hard and the chopping power that I was using was relatively high so use as advertised you probably wouldn't have a problem with the handle but for the type of woods we have around here it's not really practical to take out as sort of a wood crafting blade for general purposes so that's what we're left with with the handle removed decent lantang should be relatively easy to fit a handle to that now unfortunately when I took the tang off there's a couple of problems which are evident you can see a really rough transition in this area well if you look right above that in this area right here you can actually see the line which appears to be where the knife quality steel is forge welded likely to the top part of the steel the problem is if I look at the tang really carefully in this region right here I can see a large crack in the steel which comes out here and starts running up along the blade right here see where that little piece of steel is sort of cracked off right there by my thumb well the steel is actually split and running right up there and it's starting to split right along the actual spine of the blade that's kind of interesting because the spines of these blades are usually really really low alloy steels so it's kind of interesting to see that and it's also kind of interesting to see a join like that and very rough work there underneath the tang and similarly over here very rough work underneath the tang now again to put this in perspective um, this is one of the least expensive or most basic models you could buy in Japan so this is your entry-level knife we pay a lot more for them over here for imports and stuff like that but this is their basic model so keep in mind I mean it isn't fair to try to compare this to a hungless or something like that which is a relatively high-end knife this is the basic version of this type of Japanese knife but again unfortunately due to the crack right there I'm not going to continue using this because the danger of splitting is far too high